Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lawrence Johnson. I'm a assistant professor in sociology. I have the privilege today of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Orlando Patterson, who is a historical and cultural sociologist at Harvard University. He has held previous appointments at the University of West Indies and his alma mater, the London School of Economics, where he received his PhD. His academic interests include the culture and practices of freedom, the comparative study of slavery and ethno-racial relations, and the cultural sociology of poverty and the underdevelopment with special uh, reference to the Caribbean and African American youth. He has also written on the cultural, cultural sociology of sports, especially the game of cricket. Professor Patterson is the author of numerous texts one in which I'm most familiar is slavery and social death, but also including freedom in the making of Western culture, the ordeal of integration, and numerous others. Um, Dr. Patterson is a esteemed public intellectual. He's also received way too many awards to name, but also um, a few are the um, Ralph Bunch Award, um, the National Book Award of Nonfiction, and certainly um, many others. Without further ado, I would like to min uh, introduce Dr. Orlando Patterson. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, let's use that timer. So, let me say, first of all, um, thanks to the organizers, um, uh, Professor Yara and others, for inviting me to this um, conference. Um, I um, always enjoy the company of classicists. And, um, <laughs> uh, and um, you know, it's for, for good reasons. I mean, you know, one of the people who most encouraged me um, in my salad days um, was um, the great um, Moses Finley and his kindness. Uh, first, first, ver first version or, um, of Slavery and Social Death was written in Cambridge. Um, I visited it for a year there, partly under his tutelage. So I, I, I always have a soft spot for classics and never turned down an invitation. Um, um, made even. Um, more so by the fact that in uh, very briefly, very shortly, uh, a book will be coming out um, um, after slavery and social death, um, edited by two eminent classicists, um, uh, Walter Schneider and um, Walter Scheider, sorry, and um, John Bodell, uh, which evaluates the influence of slavery and social death and. Um, comparative and classical studies. So um, that was a grand uh, honor. And um, so I have a very, very soft spot for this. <laughs> it's just wonderful being here. So this is a very interesting topic. I'm going to read part of it, but most of the time I'll be um, um, talking since I'm, I'm, I'm more, I think I'm more interested when I talk um, from, uh, away from the text. Um, but um, so the title of my talk is Freedom and, and Contestation. And um, as was indicated in the, um, in the introduction to the conference um, by, by Professor Yara, um, the, um, the, old, the entire issue of what freedom means is, is a complex one. The way we put it in social science is that it's a highly contested concept. And so I want to begin, first of all, with the notion of what contestation means. What do we mean when we say a concept is contested? Because the nature of contestation itself is contested. <laughs> <laughs> so contestation can mean that an idea, a concept, a belief, is multiply ambiguous. Uh, without any common core meaning. It's any damn thing anyone wants it to mean. So, you know, I mean, I like freedom, so this is how I define it. And, um, so there's really no core there. No, they're there. 
Um, and some people really believe that's the case. I mean, you know, um, certainly when I contrast my idea of freedom from what I hear from certain politicians celebrating freedom, I wonder whether we are talking the same um, language even. Um, but I don't agree that that's the case, as I hope to um, argue today. Contestation can also mean that there's an agreed upon core with many interpretations. Um, and um, this comes closer to what I have in mind, although I think n um, not as close as um, I would like it. So one thing of Rawls' um, use of the term um, in which he argues that there is a concept and there are conceptions of this idea. And he discusses justice, in fact. He, he, he sort of begins with that the idea, the contested notion of justice. Um, there's, a, there's a there there, but there are different conceptions of it. Um, Stephen Lukes, um, a sociologist who's written on power, um, uh, also argues that power, like freedom, is a contested idea. Um, but they, they think there's a core, and um, it's the job of the analyst to find it, if you like. Um, there is Gali, who is the person who, in a sense, introduced the whole notion of contestation to social science. He's written at length on it, on the nature of contestation, who argues that a contested concept, yeah, may have um, a core, but it's hard to ascertain what it is. <laughs> and hard to come arrive at an agreement about what it is. So we'll endlessly argue about it, even though there may be a core there. And then there's a fascinating argument by uh, a, a woman who, uh, a philosopher, whom I admire a great deal, uh, her book on a, a philosophical study of freedom, um, Swanton, in her coherence theory of freedom, makes the intriguing argument that um, there is uh, no core necessarily but a coherent cluster of meanings around an idea. So um, as she writes, one may sensibly speak of contested conceptions referring to the same ideal without assuming the existence of a common meaning. Uh, you may think only a philosopher would end up saying a thing like that, but, um, but I, there's, there's, she, she argues powerfully for this position so that in, um, there may be in a sense, it's partly Wittgensteinian. There may be a family of meanings around an idea, and you can't point to anyone and say, that's it, but the family is there. They're all sisters and brothers, so we know it by the fact that they're kindred. And as I said, I, <coughs> I happen not to agree with it, but I think it's a fascinating idea, and I think her work um, argues it powerfully. She calls it coherence theory. That is, there's a coherent set of meanings uh, which are familiarly re related in a Wittgensteinian sense, which is the best we can hope for, and the role of the philosopher then is to pull out these um, meanings and show their um, um, relationship. I am firm enough to view that there is a core of um, ideas which constitute freedom, which is what I want to persuade you about um, today. Um, another preliminary point which I have to emphasize is that um, I am profoundly um, sort of in profound disagreement with what is the traditional way of going about studying freedom. There are hundreds of works on freedom uh, dominated by philosophers. And here the idea is that freedom is, if you like, uh, something out there which is real or rather something in there which is um, real and which is, um, it, it's, it's a universal concept. It's, a, it, it, it's, um, it's a, almost a, a Kantian imperative, which you can um, explore without, uh, you know, I guess you can sit in your armchair and dig deeply into finding what it is. That it, accompanying this idea is that it's innate. Uh, Locke said it best, it's written in the heart of men, so that everyone, all of us, um, desire and have some um, inherent notion of freedom. And um, it's the job of the philosopher, the student of freedom, to find out what is that best freedom. Um, this is a, 
what I call the rationalist prescriptivist approach uh, is what freedom should be, uh, assuming, as they all do, that is there as a universal. Um, my own, I'm strongly in disagreement with this view. Um, and um, I don't think freedom is inherent. I don't think all people necessarily want freedom. Uh, I don't think one can sit in one's um, chair and prescriptively sort of deeply explore from certain philosophical premises what this freedom is. Um, for several reasons. For one thing, most people do not come naturally to freedom. Um, most non-Western languages do not even have a word for freedom. Now, it's a fascinating philosophical um, uh, question of whether if a word for a concept doesn't exist because the concept exists. And I've had lots of arguments with philosophers about that. Um, um, and um, many non-Western people still resist it. Um, they say that there are other values more important than freedom. Many people think so. Um, you know, um, honor, um, God, worship of God, nirvana, love of one's country, um, what have you, um, and the, the union of heaven and earth and whatever. They're, they're, there are many as there are many peoples. And although there's no universal declaration of human rights, which is an idea that diffused from the West, I mean, it is still the case that there is difficulty, many peoples have difficulty with this. Now, I also have to think that it's a dangerous idea, thinking that freedom is inherent, because and that all people should be free and want to be free, even if they don't know that they want to be. Because that can get you into some rather unfree kind of foreign policy adventures. I mean, if you assume that all Iraqis have written in their hearts the desire for freedom, then it's justifiable, I guess, to send your army in to um, impose it upon the Iraqis and expect that they'll greet you with open arms, which they didn't, as you know. And um, so it's, uh, it, it's a complex idea. Now, let me make it clear. I'm, a true believer in freedom. I cherish freedom. I spend a good part of my life studying it. I would like to see the whole world believing in freedom. But that's different from assuming that they already have this desire and want to. I mean, what this suggests, from my point of view, is that this is a challenge of diffusion, of persuading other people in various. And in a way, the Declaration of Human Rights is one such attempt at the process of getting other people through learning, through persuasion, that this is a good idea. Um, but to begin by assuming that is there, in, written in their hearts, is a bad idea. And so to understand freedom, one begins by understanding that it's a socially constructed concept. That is not something out there or in there. That is a distinct product of a certain civilization, namely the West. And here I can get into trouble with a lot of people for all sort of different reasons. Amartya Sen, whom I like and is my neighbor and uh, you know, who is critical of me on this score. Uh, but I'm persuaded that it is socially constructed. That it was constructed at a certain time, a certain period, uh, going back some 2,500 years. Uh, and um, to the degree that we find it elsewhere, we find it, it's a result of diffusion. And, um, and that's what I want to discuss with you today, how this idea um, was invented, socially invented. And, um, uh, and naturally, it fits into a, 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 um, a setting um, which is organized by classicists. And, um, my approach is then socio-historical and, oddly, it's from a sociologist, Aristotelian, in that um, you know, was, I, I take my own methodological point of departure from um, Aristotle's uh, notion of um, endoxa. Um, for if, so, there's a few in classics who know and discuss it, some length in the topics and the rhetoric. That is the common conception of a subject acceptable to the many and the wise. This is a starting point. 
and doxa are those doxa beliefs, opinions that have passed the test of contestation, if you like, debate, and have achieved consensus. Um, in sharp contrast to Plato, who hated this idea, um, as um, Aristotle's dialectic approach was to begin with these and to examine how they could reasonably be reconciled, okay? How could one make sense of them in solving the logical and philosophical puzzles they present? So you go and you, you look at the phenomena out there, which is presented by the many and the wise, talking about freedom, and you bring it all together, and then you think about it, and you look at all the puzzles that the many and the wise pose in grappling with the idea, and you come up with what may be the underlying structure of the idea. And it's a beautiful idea. So this had very radical implications, by the way. Um, that, um, as uh, McLeod, who's done perhaps one of the best accounts of um, Aristotle's method in um, history of uh, um, philosophy, quarterly, uh, says so this radical idea is that the truth on a given subject is imminent in and res restricted to um, endoxa. This is a profound idea. This, it's also as, it's almost scandalous in a way. Um, the, 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 the Martha Nussbaum, of course, is a person whom one thinks of, the, um, uh, the Chicago classicist, is the one who's most developed the, the, the idea and, and argues for it. She's not just expounding it. She, she thinks it's a good idea, as I do. <laughs> I think it's a good approach. And um, it's, um, uh, as it Owen and others, um, Barnes, the classicist, thinks the idea is vicious. <laughs> I love it when classicists really get to the argument. So, you know, this, this, this is one of Aristotle's worst idea. And his argument is that it's a good thing that Aristotle abandoned it in all his writings, <laughs> which isn't true. So anyway, as you can imagine, there's a long debate about it. I'm just a historical sociologist who have to think that this is, forms the sort of foundation of a sociological phenomenology of thought in a brilliant way. And my God, I did that this was expounded 2,500 years ago is just amazing. Uh, you can see why I love uh, my classicists, right? <laughs> as, as a sociologist, uh, because I, as a historical sociologist, I'd like all my historical sociology colleagues to read uh, the topics. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin with the end of the process. What happens after looking at all the many and the wise over the centuries and the way in which I was found in, and what are the puzzles which I found, and what is the structure that emanates from the endosha? Okay? Uh, so, what it's, so, this is what I let me end by telling you what I think freedom is, uh, having studied it for many, many years both historically, by the way, and also contemporaneously. I won't have the time to get into my work because, on America because I'm doing the same thing that to, to, to do with America. I'm looking at American indoxa on our freedom by interviewing them and by doing surveys of them. And if Aristotle was around today, he would do the same thing. He said, let's do some surveys and let's do some interviews. All right? And I uh, found what Americans think. So that's what I want. But I won't have the time to get into it today. What I want to do is to talk, tell you what I think freedom is, what, what, what the result of uh, analyzing, scrutinizing the history of the many and the wise, um, thinking about freedom, and what then were the puzzles found, and what is the underlying core, which I've come up with, and, and this is it. So, not surprisingly then, the, um, the, the core of the idea um, is power. Power is at the heart of the endoxa. Um, freedom is a doctrine about what power is and should be. It may strike you as odd, but that for, 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 um, that's for reasons having to do with liberalism, and liberalism attempt to um, define um, freedom as opposed to power. It's a cultural disposition, meaning that it's not only enduring, but highly institutionalized, a component element of a system of values. And, um, and this is important. So you can find 
For those people who get quite annoyed at the idea that freedom was a Western construct, construct and remained so for hundreds of years, exclusive to the civilization, what I'm not, again, it's not just in a simple element of freedom. Obviously, all over the world, some wise man must have thought, yeah, it's good not to be enslaved or so on. Um, but the idea that this is going to become the central value of your society. It's one thing saying, I love freedom. It's another thing saying, whoopee, this is the greatest idea that ever man invented or woman. Uh, and when, what's where we're going to make it the pinnacle of our value system? That's weird. And most people, can, even people who accept the idea of freedom, consider that really strange. You're going to die for freedom? No, you die for God. You die for your country. You die for your honor. You're not going to die for freedom? What the hell is that? Um, so, um, so important then to understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an institutionalized value system. That's unusual. Okay? And what's more, it's strongly reinforced by other institutions. Uh, it's a culture. Okay? Uh, and the focus, at the heart of it, is power. Freedom is the West's way of making sense of power in a special way. So, so it has always meant then the power, uh, the positive power to do things in relation to oneself, others, and one society. Um, this is the most complex belief of the triad. By the way, in Freedom in Making of Western Culture, I use the metaphor of a chordal triad, a musical chord triad, which I think works nicely, which is integrated and which is not fragmented. Uh, power. So the most, uh, really the most complicated and the hardest to understand of the triad and the one that has caused most moral soul searching and philosophical as well as historical denials and confusion. The, the idea that power is at the heart of what freedom means will, as I just mentioned, strike many people as strange, and that's because of the tendency of liberalism, the dominant modern view of freedom, to equate all power with domination and tyranny, and to define freedom primarily in negative terms, as a resistance of power. But, you know, it's a mistake to, in, an anachronistic, to interpret freedom solely in terms of one tradition, liberalism, which is our tendency today, and which is what I want to get away from here. And by the way, liberalism has some tricks up its sleeve uh, in doing that, because power is actually quite central to liberalism. It's just found a nice way of camouflaging it. It's called property. But I can't, I can't get into that today. Um, the history of freedom shows that power has always been viewed as central to its meaning. If you look seriously at the indoxer. Um, the, um, ironically, the modern philosopher who most clearly articulated this was none other than the person viewed as a preeminent modern theorist of liberalism, John Stuart Mill. Alert to the history of freedom, Mill used the terms freedom and liberty to distinguish between freedom, broadly conceived, and what he calls the principle of liberty, okay? Or liberalism. Essential in, uh, and um, liberalism, essential negative version, uh, which is uh, obviously so brilliantly articulated in his classic book on liberty. In other words, in other works, however, Mill goes out of his way to show that freedom, broadly and historically conceived, is intimately linked to power. And they both have negative and positive aspects. And um, as um, Bruce Baum notes, I quote him, are linked in a continuing interplay, not simply an oppositional relationship, unquote. That's a very powerful insight. From archaic times down to the last quarter of the 18th century, positive freedom always had a brute and a benign aspect expressed in terms of freedom over and freedom to. So the brute aspect is simply the stark valuation of the notion that one is free to the degree that one could do as one damn well please, um, you know, with another, including the freedom to dominate and to enslave them. 
However ghastly this may sound to the modern mind, it's a simple fact of Western history of freedom that one form of positive freedom was experienced in the domination of others. Now this is where Endoxa differs from philosopher, philosophical <laughs> investigation because the philosopher's response is a ghastly idea. Well, it may be, but I'm not here to tell you what it should be. I'm here to just tell you what I'm deriving from um, the Endoxa. Okay? Um, the, the ancient Greeks had no problem associating positive freedom with power conceived in this way. Um, and um, my favorite example of that, of course, is when Nicias went to conquer Sicily and got his butt beaten. And um, when he went to sort of encourage his, his dispirited generals after they'd really been Thorough, I mean, uh, thousands of soldiers are lost, they lost several hundred ships. I always found that speech amazing. Because there he is, that he's gone to Sicily to conquer and enslave, and have enslaved the entire population if he had had his way. But he began by saying, cheer up, cheer up, fellow Athenians. We are the freest of people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a, it, 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 so no contradiction in that. But neither should any American see a contradiction. Because <laughs> with the greatest civil war in our history, which thousands and thousands of people died, half the country was fighting for their liberty. The Southerners, in fact, Southerners screamed liberty more than anyone else. The liberty to enslave a sixth of the nation. So as Americans, you shouldn't find this idea at all. Difficult to grasp. And you know, there's, there's a famous one in one of the speeches, uh, in the in the, Frederick, uh, in, the um, in the sort of Lincoln Douglas debates, in which Lincoln got back and said, you know, Judge Douglas you know, is a sensible man, a fine man, a, you know, a good scholar, and so on and so forth, and he cherishes freedom. I also cherish freedom, but there's something wrong here. I mean, I can't understand how he could, um, in his conception of freedom, uh, have a central to the idea the right to enslave others. Now, the irony here, of course, is that we are, we are all sort of on Lincoln's side. But history was on Douglas's side. Because I, it, was only, it was right up to that moment in Western history, and only after that, did the idea begin to diminish. And in many ways, the Civil War was a turning point in that history, in the history of the, 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 the Indoxa, that this is an abomination. But no one thought it was an abomination before. Well, except um, the abolitionists came before. And there was a turning point, I should say, to go back a little earlier with the abolitionist movement. Christianity didn't think it was odd. Um, neither did Islam, OK? There is, however, a benign aspect of this notion of freedom as power. Um, namely, the fact that it enables us to realize our goals which may be both external and internal, as well as self-directed and other-directed, OK? This second meaning is also ancient. And um, the, um, the in, in a sense, um, there are several, I, I don't know if I want to, but what, what, Benevinist, in his etymology of the Greek word for power, kratos, uh, one root for democracy, found that in addition to its, what he called his hard and brutal, cruel sense of delight in domination, the word, even before Homeric times, also connoted the attribute of superior skill, self-mastery, and authority in one's community. And this meaning is also identified with positive freedom. Today, we speak approvingly of being empowered or autonomous without any implication of dominating others. We also think of positive freedom as the capacity to have control over our own lives and to determine the kind of persons we want to become, right? Uh, this is freedom as self-mastery and self-actualization. Or as J.S. Mill observes in the subjection of women, the capacity of each person, quote, to govern his own conduct by his own feelings of duty and by such laws and social constraints as his conscience can subscribe to, okay? Furthermore, this benign form of positive freedom also relates to others. 
we feel free to the degree that we enable others to realize their goals, in the process mutually enhancing our own experience of freedom. Modern feminists have strongly emphasized this relational aspect of freedom as mutual empowerment. Okay? So, no, the idea of freedom of power is not so <laughs> strange as one may think. It's got this benign, uh, this, this very benign aspect, which in many ways I think our feminists have strongly emphasized because feminists have been very critical of the negative view of freedom which dominates liberalism and in fact have much of feminist thought. Um, as emphasize this positive area of freedom, not, not of course freedom is dominates others, but freedom if you like to control and have power over yourself, power within your community, power in enabling others to be empowered, mutual power, okay? Um, the second constitutive element of freedom is of course, it, um, is the degree that we are free um, only to the degree that we are able to resist compulsion. Uh, this is a central idea in the tendency in the negative meaning of freedom. Okay? A great deal of intellectual heat has been generated around the idea of negative freedom, um, which I, I don't have the time to get into here. Um, and, um, And one point I must emphasize from the start, though, is that negative freedom as ordinary people, the many and the wise, uh, have understood it throughout history, is different from, although intimately linked, to positive freedom. Um, there's a long, rather turgid debate about whether, in fact, in linguistic terms, you can, you can, you can always convert a positive, a negative freedom into a positive one. Um, but I think it's playing with words. In the real world and the history of freedom, negative freedom means being able to negate or resist attempts to compel one to do what one does not want. In fact, it's become central to the Republican idea or the so-called neo-Roman idea of freedom, which one group of philosophers um, petite and others have um, grabbed onto. It's interesting they call it neo-Roman, which is the idea that central to the idea of freedom is not being dominated. Okay. Um, but uh, the, um, this is not the same as positive freedom because it is possible to have substantial capacity to resist compulsion even where one has very little power over others or power to do most of the things one would want to do for oneself. Although the point has been largely missed in the discourse on freedom, it's remarkable how early we find this notion in the ordinary, real um, history in the of freedom. Diogenes of Sinope, one of the founders of cynicism, made his, this power of the powerless the cornerstone of his doctrine of freedom. And he's one of the great philosophers of freedom. He lived in a tub, defecated in the marketplace, masturbated in public, and took particular delight in goading Plato and the other aristocrats of his day. Uh, but no one would touch him. Indeed, he was venerated by many. One way in which he, the powerless enjoyed the freedom to resist compulsion was not by fearing what the powerful did to them. Euripides um, said it best, no man is a slave who does not fear to die. Gandhian nonviolent resistance is the admired modern instance of this. Suicide bombers, its ghastly contemporary counterpart. The idea is also fundamental in Christianity. Even before the creed learned to use martyrdom as a powerful weapon against the might of Rome, Paul was telling the early congregation, not many of you were wise by human standards, not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. Rather, God chose the foolish of the world to shame the wise, and God chose the weak of the world to shame the strong, okay? And God chose the lowly and despised of the world, those who come for nothing, to reduce to nothing, those who are something, so that human beings might boast before God. And then there's France, St. Francis, and C.C. and so on. It's a long tradition. Um, finally, um, there is the third note in the card, the third element of freedom, 
which is again about power, except now it's power sharing. I mean, the Greeks were quite explicit about it. This uh, you know, democracy is people power, the sharing of power by the people. Okay, so do it belonging, so do it participative politics. You're free to the degree then that you have some power in your community. So the elected leaders and the capacity and the power to share in the power of the community if you want to so, so do. Uh, it means legal equality. Uh, it means, in more advanced countries, citizenship. It means belonging. It means not being natally alienated. Okay. It's there are certain fundamental rights that comes from belonging to and sharing in the power. Even as an infant, you're sharing in that power in this to, to your um, legal claims of the um, broader society. So here then, as these three powerful ideas, the important thing to know is that they're triangulated. They're seen as belonging to each other. They are very important. Uh, and, 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 and one without the other does not uh, make sense. Um, and um, one of the, again, let me just dip into some of the work I'm doing more in the modern world. One of the, one, one of the tricks of liberalism is to have, in fact, undermined this third element of freedom. Uh, from the beginning in America, there's a suspicion of democracy. Mm -hmm. Ironically, part, that, that suspicion is partly justified by their reading of what was going on in ancient Greece. I mean, they thought, you know, this is crazy, it's chaos. I mean, we're too many, uh, you know, with, 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 with too much democracy uh, brought Athens to ruin. Um, and, um, the, um, and that, by the way, <laughs> the lesson we learned from that is to put constraints on democracy. Madison keep referring to the tyranny of the majority, which makes sense, but they, they put a lot of constraints. And one of the constraints they placed on democracy, part of them through their reading of what happened in Athens and the, and the negative view of what happened there, we're living with right now. Okay. Um, the Electoral College was one way of imposing constraint on um, the, 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 the potential tyranny of the majority. And guess what the Electoral College just gave us? Um, so, <laughs> but let me say, I mean, this, this um, idea, um, no one, I think, has more emphasized the fact that disdaining democracy is dangerous. And the history of America from the Constitution right through has been one of undermining it, either through demobilizing voters, preventing people from getting on the voting roll <laughs> uh, during the Jim Crow era and once again now, um, they, one way or the other. And, but the sad thing, looking at the endorser of um, America today is something sad has happened from one of my main findings from my survey work and my, um, is that um, the, um, the idea has, 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 has increasingly won out. That is, there's been an uncoupling of democracy from our notions of freedom in America. It's one of my main findings. It's not that people hate democracy or so, but I'd, I've done hours and hours of interviews with Americans, and I've done two major national surveys, and the remarkable thing about my finding is that, is what I didn't find. The people who talk to me for an hour and a half about freedom and never mention anything about democracy. Never once say, you know, among the things that make me feel free is being able to vote. It's amazing, isn't it? Hannah Arendt is, of course, is absolutely on target in her insistence that through the ages, participation is one governing group was considered an essential component of this. So that's, that's, the, that's the central, that's, those are the puzzle poses and that's what freedom was. And by the end of the fifth century, by the last third of the fifth century, certainly, um, you know, it, 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 they were there. And, um, and it is quite clearly articulated in, in Pericles' funeral oration. Absolutely. So that's what freedom is. Now, the interesting thing to note, of course, is that, that there's a tension there already. 
their costs and benefits, you can see already, the internal structure of freedom is highly contested. Certain groups, as you can see, would, certain, would prefer one note of the card, one of the one. All people see the three as essential, but ruling classes have emphasized freedom as power. Um, and, um, or the mere, the freedom that the masses desire, negative freedom, including freedom to sleep under the bridge. Um, the um, uh, mass of people have always emphasized um, sort of that's both negative freedom, freedom not to be dominated, but also wanted some kind of positive freedom. So there's a contestation about that. And of course, there's been tremendous contestation about civic freedom. Uh, how much power there should be, as we found so clearly in the forming of, in, in, in the forging of the American Constitution. That, but, so the tension is there, and um, with costs and benefits, um, those who win and those who lose, um, internal to the structure. And that's part of the beauty of the thing. It's an extraordinary tension. And the basic idea is that when it works together, it's powerful. Um, and um, when it's fragmented, you get into real danger. If you begin to emphasize freedom as power and make that central, make or surrender to an all-powerful state as the ultimate form of freedom, which is Nazi Germany, you get into trouble. Or when you sort of emphasize just freedom as equality, you could see in the neglect of the freedoms, negative freedoms. You can see how one without the other is always problematic. And that's this, so when I speak of freedom, it's this powerful card I have in mind. And uh, the history of the West can be read in terms of the struggle over who's going to define, which, 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 which note on the card is going to become the dominant one, or whether you're going to have a balance or not. Okay, so let's go back now, how did this, how on earth did this incredible idea, this incredibly complex idea come about? You can see now, this is not an easy idea. It's a complex one. And it's the, the, it's the central idea, central secular idea that has informed Western civilization for 1500 years. It's also, as we'll see in a minute, the central idea that has informed the dominant religion that fa fashion the civilization, namely Christianity. Christianity is a religion of freedom. With these same three ideas in tension with each other. Slavery was the engendering condition. Necessary, but not sufficient. As you can see, it emerged in the bosom of the slaves. This is the desire to be free from the total power of the master. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of, uh, of, of, of slavery, as I define it as a form of social death, but what's central about slavery was the totality of the master's power. In traditional and in small-scale societies, there is rarely such a thing. Most of human history resists the idea of one person having total power. In traditional kin-based societies, what you have is a sort of um, a system of counterbalancing power in which you belong to a kinship group and your kinsmen protected you. And so the position you want to be in was not the liberal position of being isolated. That's the worst possible situation you want to be in a traditional kin-based society, because you have no protectors. Uh, the situation you want to be is in a network of countervailing powers. So you have a protector there, but if he gets out of hand, you've got your father's father, your mother's brother, your sister's uncle, and so on and so forth in that network, right? Um, the idea of one person exercising total power over another is completely new, and it emerged in slavery. And it was seen from the beginning as horrible, and it was seen as something you want to get out of. And it's in the desire of the slave to get out of that condition that, well, first, negative freedom was born. I have to get out of this hell where one person, I'm merely a surrogate for another person. I'm not just a surrogate, I totally desire it. I'm not only totally desire it, I have no kinship, right? In fact, in traditional society, um, the best translation of slavery is to be kinless. Uh, it's to be natally alienated. You have no rights of birth anymore, okay? Uh, now, 
you can see why people would want to get out of that. And in that desire was negative freedom born. But something else is done in the birth of slavery. Two other things. Huh? Two other things. They, um, um, it's not just <coughs> the freedman, the desire to be a freedman was born, but also lordship. As I just said, no, in no in sad people do not have total power. They are always come to avail. It's only in slavery that you have total power over another person and can do with them as they can break all the laws. So that's in say matrilineal <coughs> societies. Okay? And very often slavery is used as a way of getting around fundamental rules. Matrilineal societies, your sister's your, your property is inherited by your sister's son, not by your not, not, not by your natal son, not by your birth son or birth child. The only one you're getting around it is, is to have a woman who's totally under your control and therefore, and, and who is kinless. And so her children by you are your children. Um, the, um, so the idea then of having total control over a woman, total control over a body uh, in which her kinsmen have no say is totally new in the world and comes with slavery the totality of the power of the master. And that has become a kind of freedom. The freedom to do as you please with another person. The freedom in knowing that another person is no more than a surrogate of yourself. Uh, and that has very important implications for advanced many societies. And finally, <coughs> slavery does this other thing. It creates a free man who was not born a slave or who was not a slave owner, but who in the very presence of slaves, discovers, whoopee, I'm not a slave, I'm free. Uh, well, so the idea of going around saying, uh, this is, oops, this is telling me that I'm almost, that I, I belong to a free tribe, is ridiculous if there are no slaves, right? Makes sense. All right, you can see why it makes no sense it's for people to think they're free if there wasn't a contradistinctive group. And, and, and by the way, the, the origins of the word, um, the Indo-European origins of the word makes this absolutely clear. If you go to the deepest, deepest, deepest um, roots of the word, as Carl, ba Carl Watkins, the late Carl Watkins, the etymologist, how the etymologist did, the deepest origins of the word free means among the beloved. I don't know if Tony Morrison was using our dictionary when she got that title, but I mean, it, it, we, it, it, it means we who are not slaves. That's the original meaning of a free person, right? So slavery does these three one incredible things, all in one shot. The desire to be released from this horrible condition of social death, as I call it, to be free, a strange desire which no one ever thought of before because it would be a stupid idea to be born to be free. <laughs> to have total power over another, again, another crazy idea since, you know, society just didn't allow that. Free in the sense of absolute power over. And free in the sense that we're not them. We, the free, the beloved, the great ones. So, um, but why necessary is not sufficient? Because as you know, there are lots of societies before Greece which had slavery, the ancient, all over the ancient Near East, and so on. But this didn't happen. This didn't happen for once for sociological reasons. There is no place for the free person. Um, in the ancient Near East, if you freed, uh, you by and large wanted to remain in, 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 in the palace freedman. You, you remain with your master. There's no place for you outside. Besides, you wouldn't want to go celebrating the idea that you were free. This is the other strange thing that emerged, really. When you think about it logically, it makes little sense that freedom should have become such a celebrated idea. Since, what does it tell you? It tells you that you were once a slave. So no one wanted to go around saying, I'm free because it, oh. Well, really, uh, how did you, what were you doing before you became free? <laughs> you know, I mean, so it becomes fascinating that you should have a society in which a lot of people went around saying, my God is free. 
Not to mention celebrating it on your tombstone. As, uh, <laughs> uh, that's weird, right? <laughs> I mean, think about it. It's very, very weird. Um, and only in Greece, what well, it didn't happen in Greece to, to a large extent. It's, it's in Rome that you got that. So something else, Nece it's necessary but not sufficient. And that sufficiency we find in the history, in the invention, uh, the Greek invention of freedom. Now, I don't have the time to go through it. You can read a number of studies <laughs> of this. Uh, you can even take a peek at my own freedom in the making of Western culture. But uh, you know, it's interesting to talk about the cost of freedom and the role of debt. I mean, the, the, the past of freedom began with a re revolt of debt bondsmen, <laughs> right? Uh, and it was a threat of rebellion which led the elite in Athens under Soran to introduce the forgiveness of debt. And a long story then proceeded, which I don't have the time to get into, in which essentially the ruling class, having of necessity um, forgiven all the debts, and indeed went so far as to buy back people who had been sold into slavery, which was a very unusual thing to have done, um, which by the way suggests to me that those death bond men were very close to being slaves. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I mean, say when they were being sold, you know, I mean. Uh, so you can read the entire history of what followed, right? Um, and through the sixth century, um, as uh, an interesting trade off. After the forgiveness of debt, the former, um, what do you mean, what they call it? Desmond, Ben Sars, whatever. I mean, there's a big argument about what exactly they were. Um, but they, that wasn't enough because they discovered, yeah, we got our freedom, but, but we don't have much land. <laughs> and they wanted more in terms of redistribution. And uh, the people who have been maligned as um, tyrants, right? You know, Plato and that gang, um, were in fact renegade elite people who came to their uh, support and so on. But in the end, what happened was a trade off. The more they desired, economic redistribution, it was met with political redistribution. That's the way I like to read it. Uh, one after the other, and in a sense, democracy emerged out of this trade-off. So by, by the um, fifth century, by, by the end of the third, third, first third of the fifth century, it was pretty well largely in place. And, um, and then, of course, you got the full-blown democracy by the um, last half of the fifth century, which it was just a remarkable invention. The first such. And you know, look, there's a few books written about democracy in other parts of the world. I mean, meeting under the banyan tree to talk about the problems of the tribe is not democracy. Talk about a highly institutionalized system in which you are voting and highly developed representatives and so on, representing, in which you are paid to vote. My goodness. <laughs> uh, is that incredible? I mean, compared to what we have in America today. Um, and uh, it was, we won't even allow people to vote on Sundays. Um, so um, it, this, this, this incredible system emerged. And so there's this, there's a great moment. Um, but so freedom became this tripartite system really emerged in full flower. And uh, already you find different groups emphasizing one or other aspect of the, the triad, although everyone recognized it. And, and you know, as I said, um, Pericles said it just clearly. I mean, I, I know what an, an American lawyer reading Pericles for moderation would have recognized everything he said as constitutive of freedom uh, as we understand it today. So you would find that, um, however, the metics were the ones who would more emphasize free, the negative freedom. But they had little chance of real, it is a selective democracy, you know. Uh, it was a Herrenbach democracy. <coughs> That's what it was. Okay, um, and um, it excluded um, resident aliens, including, by the way, Aristotle <laughs> was a resident alien. Which is one of the interesting ironies of uh, the past. Um, but it was there. The Greeks discovered it and they kept it to themselves largely. This freedom. But we um, there was a second great moment in the ancient world, this is a Roman um, um, moment, and then the third was a Christian. Um, but I just want to mention one other important development, 
which is the fact that these three ideas, this this card, from very early had an inner and outer dimension. And we we can trace that right back to Plato. And um God Plato did two remarkable things. Of course he's an aristocrat and he was very skeptical of his vulgar freedom. He's just skeptical of, of the outer freedom. So one of the things he did was to interject talk about real freedom, inner freedom. Okay. But the remarkable thing is that he took over the tripod idea almost entirely in an internal sense. And so the slave impulses <laughs> and just escape from the slave impulses as well. Though. That's not freedom. Real freedom is what? Power, control over those slave impulses inside you. <laughs> Incredible. And um, the, um, I didn't have much, this is a democracy idea was there, but that idea of freedom was controlled. But it's typical of our aristocrat to see that inner freedom, power, over one's, uh, over one's impulses. This is the essence of freedom. But it's interesting that you did that. Uh, if, this, if you think that this is some far-fetched, one well, of the great classicists, Vasras, has done just one of the greatest works on, on the, the, the rule of slavery in Plato's thought. Just go and read it, because that's, um, that's where I first realized, my god, I mean, took it over Lux, Arab, and Barl and internalized it. So read Vasras' is sort of great piece, maybe in, in, in Plato's thought. You see what I'm, I, I'm not making this up. Uh, and of course, Plato's influence, this aspect of Plato's influence, was of course the source of Stoicism. Right? Because Zeno said you just simply took over the idea or in a more liberal sense and sort of developed it. So, and that's in preparation. So, Rome, of course, the ideas were, uh, were there too. Rome notes, though, was the greatest, the most amazing, the most incredible slave society in the history of the world. There is no other slave society. It's in a class by itself. It's even hurts. It's um, in its totality, in the extent of slavery, both in the rural areas and in the urban areas, in almost all the occupations except the military, in the lower levels of the civil service, and of course, uh, in, during the Claudian sort of um, uh, empire, even up to the highest levels of um, the, 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 the imperial administration. Amazing. And it is not in the commerce, of course, is dominated by um, uh, 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 freedmen, because the Romans being very honorable, they're too honorable to run their businesses. And uh, of course, the way to do this is to get a freedman to do it. That's the example. Cicero. Cicero is a bloody slumlord. I mean, you know, there's all this wonderful sort of uh, <laughs> nobility and so on. You won't catch him going anywhere near there. Very simple solution get your freedman to run it. And so this is really just incredible for me. And as I so, you know, clearly pointed out this morning, um, the, um, the, 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 what's new here is not only the pervasiveness of manumission, but they were proud of their freedom. Gone is the idea that, no, you didn't want to tell anyone you're free, God, they may think what, what you are, what on earth, see me, you're once a slave. I'm proud of the fact that I was once a slave. I so and so, and this one was wonderful. Sorry, I forget your name. No, I forget your name. Rose. As Rose, um, I showed this morning. Um, it's just, they were there, they celebrated the idea. This, of course, centralism is the libertas, negative freedom, became pervasive, just universalized. And note, they did something which the Greeks would have been horrified by. The best way of becoming a Roman citizen was to be, uh, to be manumitted from the state of slavery. Isn't that incredible? Um, and, um, so, but you had a decline of formal civic freedom, but the idea of freedom, civic freedom and citizenship was still alive and well. And in some uh, Roman scholars have pointed out there's a very really rough kind of um, civic freedom expressed by the, 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 the masses um, in, um, in, in the way in which they, um, um, you know, um, in their behavior at public gatherings and so on. But um, the, uh, the central idea, the powerful idea, are two powerful ideas, the notion of freedom, the negative one, and the one of freedom as power. And what I find fascinating was um, what Augustus did with this. And um, 
the Augustan Octoritas is genius. He's sort of um, the idea that, in a sense, his absolute power guaranteed the lesser negative freedom, the libertas of the masses. And that became almost celebrated in, 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 in of course, the, the, um, in the imperial cult. So in a way, the idea here is that you, you throw yourself, you, you surrender to the absolute power of the, the genus of the emperor who protected your, so freedom, one form of freedom is surrender to the total freedom, absolute power of the emperor. In, uh, and of course, what the thing which successful freedmen desired most of all was to become a member of this uh, imperial cult. Um, and I find it fascinating the way in which this thing was continued. Um, um, the, the use of the model of the master freedman by emperors to symbolize rule. Galba is Pilius, which is a slave. Gap, you know, sort of this passage use of the term adserta, which is the term you use to a uh, freedman defending the right to find his free. It's amazing uh, how this idea developed. Now, I have I don't need to show you these again because I, <laughs> you saw you saw them because some of them I, I just love these, these these are some of my favorites. Okay, finally, the idea this triad this triangulation of power became sealed in the Western culture with Christianity. Now Christianity, it's important to know, there are, two, there are two religions with Christianity. There's a religion of Christ, and there's a religion which finally triumphed. Christ, the, the Christianity we worship, uh, go to today, those of us who are Christian or were Christians, <laughs> uh, um, is not a religion of Jesus. The, that's, wonderful colonial Jew with radical ideas were far too radical for his time in a way. It's of course the religion that Paul, the second founder, made in, um, in reinterpreting uh, Jesus. And what's central to Paul was not Jesus' life and uh, Jesus' say. Paul in his copious writings, relatively copious, <laughs> I didn't compare with Matthew and Mark, so. I mean, only once actually cited Jesus. This is pretty amazing. It's not about appropriation. This is amazing. <laughs> um, you know, and, um, <laughs> what he did was to make central to Christianity not Jesus' life and what Jesus had to say about the poor and all that stuff, <laughs> but Jesus' death and what it means for your salvation. Okay? That was the, that's why it's almost called a second founder. And by the way, I'm not saying anything radical new. Maybe some of you who don't know the history of Christianity, but this is standard stuff, okay? Um, and what he did, well, here's a fascinating thing. Now remember, he was writing in Rome, right? First century, Rome. Right in the thick of, of Roman slave society. Most of the early Christians and primitive church were low class people or slave, and, but especially the more influential ones, ex slaves, freedmen. What was central to them? What was the central idea to them? What was they writing about in their tombstones and so on? Freedom. In fact, the Latin word, as you know, is redemptio, to buy someone out of. And you know what? If you, that's the central idea in Christianity today, you know. Redemption. If you disbelieve me, you turn on your Christian radio show on Sunday mornings. <laughs> it's all about redemption. It's all about buying someone out of slavery. Yeah. Um, and so what Paul did was literally lifted the secular triad and interjected it. It's clear the negative notion of freedom is there in Galatians, which came first, although in the Bible it's placed after Romans, okay? You have been bought at a price. You've been bought at Jesus' death. Okay? Sin was analogous to slavery. And you're bought at a price. Jesus paid with his life to buy you out, to redeem you out of sin into freedom. You are bought at a price. 
Um, and, um, and he celebrates that negative freedom in Galatians. Celebrate an extreme language, you know. There's no more Greeks, there's no more Jews, there's no more men, there's no more women. You know the famous passage. <laughs> it's one of the greatest expressions of negative freedom ever. Uh, free from the law, right? Um, and um, that idea, of course, has become central, redemption then. The internalization of the Roman idea of libertas, of, of, of what it meant, what was central to the freedmen, to the people who were. And remember, you know, you can't emphasize how important slavery was. Remember, Paul traveled thousands of miles around the Roman Empire. And one of his major areas, of course, was Corinth. That's where he got major support, he wrote, he wrote a couple of letters, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it's very bothered by the Corinthians, especially the women who started getting ideas about what it meant to be free. They say, you're misunderstanding me. He started backtracking after a while. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, but you know what Corinth was? Corinth, yeah, it was, but it was destroyed, remember? And you know who refounded Corinth? You know who Caesar Center refound Corinth? Freedmen. This is the most sort of uh, important society of, uh, in the world. It's a society actually founded by freedmen. That was the happy hunting ground of freedmen, right? <laughs> and that was Paul's happy hunting ground, you know? And that's where he got all of his funds and support and so on. So that was central idea then. But Paul didn't stop there. So there's a huge debate among theologians, I don't want to story the religion, about what's happened Paul. The problem, what seems to be a contradiction in Paul between the two great letters, Galatians and Romans. <coughs> so, uh, Romans comes first in the, in the New Testament, but it is, um, um, it, it, you know, it, it is afterwards in which he picked up on this idea of freedom as surrender to the all-powerful. Which is straight out of the idea, the Augustan authorities, that you're most free. What is that? Slaves of righteousness, slave of God. Which, of course, is an ancient idea itself. And uh, but the guy was obsessed with it. And, uh, being a sociologist, I had to do some quantitative work on <laughs> Paul. So I mean, it's interesting to look at his use of the word um, free and you know, compare it with. You know, the other uh, synoptic um, gospel writers. Um, look, look at this. Now, there are two things to note here. Um, that um, his use of the term um, freedom, okay, sort of um, the, the root. We look at the Eleuther root as well as dual, uh, the dualist root and slavery. And just look at that. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the bar on the left. See, the, um, it's, it's just incredible how um, he uses the term freedom. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not found, the word freedom isn't found in, in, in Mark uh, or Luke. Just one reference, I think, in Matthew. That's, that's Paul. Uh, interestingly, uh, and compared even with John, uh, who was strong, sort of, um, uh, strong influence, and one would have thought much more. Now, what the other interesting thing is look at the word, use the word slave. Now, slavery was common in Jesus' time, but the term was used in a taken for granted way. Uh, and so you do get it in Matthew um, and, uh, and Luke and Mark. But here's the interesting thing it's not used dialectically, and there's a way of proving that. And that's sort of, um, you look, this is what I. What I did here was uh, a, co a core occurrence analysis. That is to say, you look at the occurrence of a word in a sentence, in a paragraph, and you see the extent to which it occurs in proximity to another word in the same sentence. How often? In Paul, it's all over. Paul always uses the terms that, in other words, he's using the terms uh, in, in dialectical relations with each other. Freedom, slavery, freedom, slavery. Freedom. You get nothing like this. Nothing like this in, um, in any of the other texts. See? Uh, this is, so, um, he was just amazing, I mean, what he did in introducting that idea, okay? 
So that's where I want to leave out by this section. It is wonderful. My favorite young um, classicist now, uh, Kyle's, Kyle's work on, on uh, what Christianity did then, so foundations of individualism in late Roman Christianity. So, but, but I just mentioned to you, basically, the basic thesis was that the Romans were not opt out about sex. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what it openly, freely, and so on. I mean, the, the whole idea of shame and sex and so on came with Christianity after the Constitution. And, and, and Kylie's wonderful work from, uh, from shame to sin um, to sort of explore that. It has important implications from my later work on America, because um, and, uh, you know, the Puritan idea I suppose, is sort of very, very sort of deeply rooted in this. But we can't go there, because I want to basically wrap up by saying that by then, the um, Roman you know, by, by, by the end of the first century, certainly by the late Roman period, and certainly with the triumph of Christianity, um, with the um, Constantine conversion. What you had then is the notion of freedom becoming central, both to the secular thought of the West and to the religious thought of the West. And if you ask me, well, how is this ancient idea lasted a thousand years, well, this is the answer. Christianity simply interjected it. Lock, stock, and bar it. And in fact, one interpretation, growing interpretation of what happened in the early modern world was simply, a large part of political thought was simply the projection back into the secular world of the Christian doctrine of freedom the Roman Christian doctrine of freedom, which Christianity had interjected. There's several wonderful works on that. And in fact, who is the, the leading liberal thinker when you think of liberalism or modern you think of Locke? Well, the, the, the contemporary, most advanced interpretation of Locke's doctrine is that it's simply applied to Christianity. Locke <laughs> was a profound Christian person. And this is just an extra or projection back in a lot of so the categories were there. The idea of negative freedom, the idea of positive freedom, the idea of civil freedom. And people struggled with it, with elites sort of using, emphasizing one or the other notion. And Christianity itself was used as a tool in the imperial um, uh, exploration. Uh, let me give you my favorite example, of course. Uh, the way in which, what do you interpret uh, the, the crisis, how you interpret crisis? crucifixion, whether they interpreted it in penitent terms or in majestic terms, was um, as a, a well-known work on um, how Catholicism um, Christianized the Indians. It was a pretty blatant way in which um, Christianity was interpreted one way for the conquerors, especially the Easter, the Easter um, ritual, um, Good Friday, the penitent Christ was the Christ. Missive Christ, um, um, you know, redeem your sins, but the other life, and so on, for the Indians, and the glorified Christ of Easter Sunday. And uh, there's a wonderful book which sort of explored on a great name. We find them doing the same thing with Black Americans and the Black Nation, but of course, Black Americans resisted. And there's a long story to be told about the cultural struggle over freedom and what freedom and Christianity meant between. Uh, black Americans who did not fall for it, and, um, uh, or partly did for a while. It's a complicated story. So it's rejected, it's rejected, and then there's a period there from about 1910 to about 1915, which is uh, uh, a rather conservative redemption But, but, I want to end on this note. The radical roots of Christianity the idea of Christianity in partly reflected in, um, in, 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 in Paul's letter to the Galatians, but also in, um, in the original Christianity of <laughs> Peter's, um, had a long history, but has always, always quashed. There have been the history of the Middle Ages and the history of revolt, always, always, in every case, in every case of the um, uh, rebellion, surf rebellion. It occurred 
because <laughs> um, the, 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 this radical aspect of Christianity, right? Um, um, all this bothered the elites right through the Middle Ages. And there are several ways in which, of course, they try to repress the radical notion of freedom in Christianity. One of the most effective ways is, of course, just to teach them in a language people didn't understand. It's <laughs> 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 beautiful. I mean, I they can't beat that. <laughs> uh, so, all the priests do it. And so. so, but almost all the rebellions, in every case of a slave revolt, uh, of a peasant revolt, it came about as well as a renegade priest telling them, members, you know, I got something to tell you. You know what's in this. You know what's in the nations. And um, I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm putting it in a funny way, but that's essentially um, almost all the radical. Right? And this stuff, right up to the slave and revolt, right up to um, you know the Great Revolt, um, you know, in southern Germany, uh, it, it, um, you know, the German peasants who, who interpreted the Reformation in radical terms. Yeah. Until Luther said, "My God, look, we got to do something about this. You're wrong. You're wrong. Stop using my name in vain and read it." turn against them in a big way and join up with the princes. But they all fail. There's only one radical interpretation of Christianity by an, op an, an oppressed group. So I'm leaving all the Reformation without the Reformation as an elite movement, uh, which succeeded. And you know which one it was after 1,500 years of Christianity? This is for the civil rights movement. Uh, so that's the story. <laughs> that's in a very brief nutshell. Uh, this extraordinary idea of Christia of um, freedom, essential to both the secular thought of the West and its religious thought. But that is a tense, very contested idea with all sort of implications of class resistance and so on. Uh, which explains the uh, resilience of Christianity, in fact, but also explains the resilience of the idea, the secular idea, and why it finds appeal to people in other parts of the world. Well, you're not going to get people to accept it by sending in the army. Uh, that only happened once successfully, and that was in Japan, and that was special circumstances. Well, it's a powerful idea, and, um, and it has its roots in the Greco Roman world, quite clearly, in ancient times. There's nothing new which is going to draft the words, except the goals of contestation. Thank you. I move to say amen. Thank <laughs> <laughs> <Back> you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here at Brooklyn College. Thank you for believing in this conference and agreeing early on. Thank you for motivating many of us to push forward with the project and giving energy and thought to us as we labored over the last year in our own deliberations. And thank you for refreshing us with new ideas or ideas we felt we knew but had to pull together. I, I, I'm very grateful. Thanks. Um, we are slightly behind schedule, but I'm not going to, if you're willing to take a few questions, I don't want to deny this audience an opportunity to ask them. Um, who has a question? Yes, sir. So. Yeah, and considering your opening remarks, I hope you don't mind that this question is not coming from an inspiring classicist, but rather a boring sociologist. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. And, and as much as I'd be interested by yeah. hearing the word about, or, uh, you know, pushing you in on the question of um, how specific this value is to yes. the, uh, Western culture, I, I'd rather take a different view and yeah. ask how and how far all these components you outlined are actually. Uh, um, present in Western culture, especially if you consider uh, the history after the making of, of Western culture, like b volume two, what's happening afterwards with the event of the state system, yeah. with um, uh, um, 
the, the market system, yeah. etc. How do they affect um, <coughs> uh, this value? And how far do they change it? And the question is coming uh, not only from a social theorist, but from a, someone who's from Germany, yeah. and given that the third component of freedom, civic freedom, yeah. has traditionally been conceived in, in, in Germany quite differently, and gladly then we turn to the American experience in which civic freedom was in fact, as you said, conceived uh, 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 with the link to democracy. It is, uh, um, the civic freedom is uh, um, bringing about power together with others, while the German context was more the uh, uh, traditional European one where you had a power that was then constitutionally constrained, so limited by a, a negative freedom, not brought about, um, which is a very, very different kind, the Rechtsstaat from the rule of law. Um, and how far do these dif distinction differences in experience yeah. um, uh, get, get into this picture and how far would volume two yeah. make a change? Volume two is simply looking at the various ways in which the modern world reinterpreted and played with this basic triad, okay? And, um, and what was emphasized, um, which of the three notes was emphasized um, more than the other? Um, I read German history in a very simple way, I mean, in, in the sense that um, the idea of freedom as power, and you know, the Hegel, I mean, the idea of freedom as surrender to a powerful entity in which you find your freedom in the greater power of that um, um, uh, all powerful entity um, is there, is nestled there of course, in our one reading of um, Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, it's there in Hegel's notion of the state. It's and it it became a sort of um, a, a, a central thread, a disturbing thread, that element of freedom, freedom as power, and not only as power, but the the, the best freedom is the freedom achieved in sort of. Um, Surrender to an all-powerful entity. See, your freedom, you share in that power. I mean, in a, in sadly, I mean, that, uh, it's, it's a poly notion of freedom in in, uh, in, in, in Roman, and it, it's it's there right through um, um, uh, uh, medieval notions of um, what true freedom is, the prince, and uh, and of course Hegel basically sort of. Um, notion of the state is that, and of course it, it culminates in the most perverse way in the Nazi state because um, people really, here's the sad thing about Nazi Germany, surveys are done there indicated that people felt, never felt more free. This is sad, but this, this is part of the endox. That, that freedom came in those sort of incredible Rituals of the state, in which the state is symbolized in one person standing up there, the Führer. And your freedom came in your, in your sharing in that powerful uh, I, um, experience. Huh? That, that's a dangerous, it's a, all of these ideas, all of these notions of freedom taken separately can be dangerous. Negative freedom, the idea of freedom as being, leave me alone, I want my lonely, the selfishness, the complete sort of isolation. You know, you're free, you're free. So you didn't buy your health um, insurance, okay, you're free to die. I mean, someone actually said that, it was the name said, I don't know. I mean, so each one of those elements came to extreme. It can be brutal. Uh, it's, it's horrible to think. That we we were saying, you know, you're free to die, you're free to starve. That's freedom, um, and even democracy, can, and e too much equality can be dangerous. Okay, and one extreme, of course, is extreme communism. Uh, it's the other extreme is the tyranny of the majority. Karen uh, democracy is, of course, the form that they took uh, in the South. Um, we are the superior group. Who are the only ones um, uh, you know, worthy of freedom? And our freedom is almost bought at the expense of those who are not free. Right? You know, they define us, who are white, who are Greek, 
you know, who are who are not barbarians, who are so I mean that idea, I mean the Greek the, the Greek idea for him was a kind of heron quality idea. So all sweet by themselves. And now I don't want to celebrate the welfare state so much, but I mean but I want to say that what happens there in the attempt was an attempt at a reintegration of that, those three notions after all these different paths. Now what happened in America, as I mentioned, is that two notions of freedom, the idea of negative freedom, the idea of um and of, of um, uh, um Positive freedom, uh, you know, was um, uh, and the idea of freedom as power was in fact rejected in liberalism, but only uh, in, 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 in a rather um, suspect way. Because, as I said earlier, freedom as power is alive and well in the idea of property being the most sacred freedom. And Marx, I no longer Marxist, but you know, I got one of my favorite Marxists. It was, you know, summarized the whole history of the transition from feudalism to capitalism. And when he said, in the feudal society, people exercise power over property by means of their exercise of power over people. In capitalism, you exercise power over people through your exercise of power over property. If you have the power by the stroke of a pen to wipe out a whole community by saying, I'm going to send my factories to um, China, that's power, and that's freedom. Yes? Yeah. Um, we have one more question from Chara. Sorry, Mark. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. I need a little clarification because I, I, I thought I heard you say maybe there was not a dialectic, but I hear a dialectic. And I'm wondering if this is how it was reproduced over time um, from this uh, religious space into the secular. Uh, even if I read here, Christians preach a liberating message of freedom, you know, from from um, freedom from something, from from whether it's out of, the cos out, out of the cosmos or from another group of, of, of oppressive group. Um, they they are uh, they are liberated or their their freedom is purchased. But then they go and they conquer someone else, and whom they vanquish, they then say, well, you know what, you're vanquished, but we buy your freedom, and you're free under and through us. Uh, this is kind of what I'm hearing. I'm not sure if no, I, no, no, I'm no, wondering no, what I'm missing. No, 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 no. no. The freedom, the, the Christian doctrine is always eternal. Okay? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm saying um, the thing you're free from, was sin. Mm -hmm. Okay, sin became slavery. That's the metaphor. Um, slavery was the metaphor for sin. And what Paul did is to say that you are bought out of slavery to sin through the blood and the salvific mm -hmm. sacrifice or crucifixion of Christ. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And you're free now. What I'm saying is in Galatians, he said, you're free, and it's a very liberating idea of freedom. You're free to do anything you want. You're free from the law. I mean, you know, they're no longer Jews or so on and so forth. You know the famous passage. It was a celebration of negative freedom. Uh, I'm saying that he then pulled back in Romans, or rather, didn't so much pull back. My interpretation of it is that he saw this as a superior freedom, in which he said something very interesting that um, what is this freedom which you're given, right? Um, buy prices, sacrifice, purchase it. What do you want to do with it? In, in Galatians, you seem to say, you can do it in anything you want. This is quite clear, and that's why they say. And uh, then in Romans, uh, Romans said, no, um, you, uh, it must mean something more than that. And there are two fascinating ideas as which are in, in Romans, um, one of which draws on the, uh, as I said, the, 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 the Roman uh, idea of um, the imperial cult idea, which, you know, uh, the ultimate freedom is freedom in the imperial cult. He used that analogous, let's say. Freedom is enslavement to God. That's what he said. I mean, please, if you ever read, 
And it's always interesting rereading part. <laughs> it's like it's really quite. But you know, there's something else which he did, which marks back to the notion of natal alienation, because he does suggest that the freedom that the freedman is has means nothing if you're just wandering in the wilderness, you're not, you've got to return home. And there is some notion that you return, in return to the kingdom of God, you're returning home. So your mentality is restored. This is all internal. I'm not talking about external stuff now. I'm saying that much later on, in the modern world, that those, those ideas, um, um, which percolated through the Middle Ages and which were projected back into the secular world from which they came and became very radical in some cases, but also became be very conservative because, I mean, if you had kings referring to, um, um, to, 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 to this biblical account, one, one is a, in, um, um, they, um, I'm saying that the secularization, re-secularization of Christianity was an important source of modern social thought. Um, so, so I'm saying that the potential, the radical potential is always there, where it's kept. And we still say, you know, like, hey, uh, we're talking about an internal freedom here. Most of the time, that's what conservatives are. With black Americans, you know, they simply try to teach them that don't get any ideas here. The salvation you're going to get is in heaven afterwards, after you die. This has nothing to do with modern, the modern world, right? But people, very few people accept it that way. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and several ways in which they went back is by interpreting either the radical part in Galatians or going back to the first Christianity, which is Jesus' social gospel, Sermon on the Mount and all that. It's a complex story. Okay? <laughs> That's a complicated story. But uh, but what the central idea is that look, this, this, this is Western. And, uh, and the, this complex idea uh, is a beautiful idea when it works together, when it's harmonized, when it's triangulated. I think it's the most beautiful and secular idea there ever was. But when it's fragmented, you can see people moving in one direction. Liberalism. This, this can be ghastly. You know, the dark satanic bills of the 19th century, you think of now it's happening in the Midwest and so on. People are suffering, you know, and, uh, but they're free, you know. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't want to end with this one because they don't know that. Le the left has become so disgusted with the way in which freedom has been appropriated by the right that um, most people don't like to write or talk about freedom. I mean, it's, I have a hard time persuading my soci fellow sociologists to take freedom seriously as, as, as a subject of study. Very few sociological works on freedom. Now, it's been tainted, it's been seen as a right-wing thing. And, um, and I think it's unfortunate because I think it's the most powerful construction of the West. When you recognize it in its, that beautiful, triangulated, or if you want to use a metaphor of triangulation, if you want to use a metaphor, a musical metaphor, chord, the tribe working together is a beautiful harmony. Fragmented, it can lead to real danger. And we're in a state now in America of a fragmented situation, where liberalism uh, is, 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 is moved in a very, very hard, um, cruel direction, right? And you know, King wanted I wanted to get back to the, the civil rights and, and, and King's writing. Uh, we should stop secularizing uh, King so much. Martin Luther King was a serious theologian, and he saw this. He saw this when he talks of the beloved community. He was seeing that harmony, and um, in, and and that's what he. But, but of course, because we don't take freedom very serious, we don't take King's writings. It's religious writings, you see, I said, but you should, and you'll see what I mean. Thank you. Sorry. Okay.